We're continuing our study in what I'm calling Joshua's Servant Academy. This is part three. So if you've all of a sudden just showed up and you've missed part one and part two, I know that there are CDs available, but you can go online, you can go to our website, you can go to calvarycsd.org, and it's my understanding, James, that we have a YouTube channel, and you can subscribe. So there's lots of opportunities to catch up. Tonight, we look at Joshua Servant Academy number three. You guys ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Jesus. Lord, your love is really rich. It is great. It is deep. It is wide. And Lord, even though we sing the song, your love is all we'll ever need, we don't always feel it in our hearts and we don't always believe it with our mind. We think we need something else, someone else, something more. Lord, in moments of honesty, we find ourselves sometimes preoccupied with our broken past or with maybe even a recovering present. But Lord, we still look to victory as something yet future, something perhaps far away. But Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would remind us, Lord, that you've called us to abundant life, to a victorious life, to a life where we get to experience repeated victories over sin, and that we can have confidence, Lord, that we are men and women who can live lives of joy and peace, and love. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at the mention of Joshua in the writings of Moses. And we've discovered, remember, that Moses, that Joshua was Moses' servant before he was Moses' successor. And that the mentions that we find of Joshua give us a clue. It gives us insight into the experiences and the character that Joshua was going to need to have in order to fulfill the plan and the purpose that God had for him. Joshua was going to be called by God to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And when we finally begin our study in the book of Joshua, we're going to discover its great theme, which is victorious Christian living. We're going to also see the similarity that just like the children of Israel are going to be called to occupy the land of promise, we as Christians are called to occupy Christ. And in that occupation, for many of us, there are things in our lives that don't want to go away. Joshua's called into a land where the people don't want to go away who are already there. And sometimes there are things in our lives that don't want to go away, that don't want to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. We've already discovered that Moses began his ministry by teaching Joshua a lesson about prayer. That power is not in the sword, but in the Lord. We've also seen vision. That remember, vision is the ability to see God in the circumstance that we find ourselves in. Devotion and loyalty. And now we're going to be looking at the subject of faith and filling. And by that I mean with the Holy Spirit. And available. And you'll recall that Joshua was one of the 12 spies who was tasked with the job of scouting out the promised land. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, we're going to just give a brief, brief overview of these chapters. 
In chapter 13, we find ourselves at Kadesh Barnea. At the beginning of the chapter, I'm just going to read quickly. And the Lord said to Moses, or spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. And you'll notice that there's a number of names that are given from the different tribes. It says from the tribe of Issachar, Egal, from the son of Joseph, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea in verse 8. That's another name for Joshua. It's our friend Joshua who shares with our Savior the same name, Yeshua, which means Jehovah or the Lord saves. And in verse 20 it says, then Mo, well, actually, beginning in verse 16, it says, These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. After 40 days of infiltrating the land, evaluating its occupants, assessing the resources, this Israeli commando team returned to provide a report to Moses and the people. Joshua and Caleb come back with a good report. The other 10 spies file an evil report. What all of them had in common was the belief that the land was bountiful, but 10 said the occupants were powerful, too powerful, both in size and number, to overcome their cities or strongholds, well fortified. In the, mid, in the minds of these faithless spies, it was a suicide mission. Joshua and Caleb said just the opposite, to not fear the people of the land. As a matter of fact, the report that Joshua and Caleb gave, they said that they are, and it's an idiomatic expression in the Hebrew language, it says that there are bread. But actually it means sweet bread. It's the idea that we, they're like cake. In Spanish we would say pan dulce. They're sweet bread. We could have these guys for breakfast. They're a cakewalk. All Israel has to do is trust the Lord and move in. Clearly, it's going to be a battle, but it's going to be a winnable war. And the people refused to believe Joshua and Caleb. And when they heard, they attempted to stone Joshua and Caleb in chapter 14 verses 1 through 10. Look what it says. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, hey, let's select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Verse 6, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jepunah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Do not, only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't Fear the people of the land. They are our sweet bread. Their protection is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting. Before all the children of Israel. The people resisted. Joshua and, Jake, and, and Caleb. They rejected the report. 
and rejection of God's word invariably results in judgment. The tragic consequence is going to include 40 additional years of wilderness wanderings. This is going to be a generation that's going to perish. And God's going to have to raise up yet another generation to occupy the land. And by the way, everyone in the wilderness under the age, or excuse me, over the age of 20, except for Joshua and Caleb, are going to perish. Now, part of the point that is taking place in the text is you have two different groups of people. Joshua and Caleb with faith, the other ten without faith. In other words, God had made promises and made a provision, and there are two great groups of people in our lives. The group of people who say, we can live the Christian life. There's a good God. There's a a Christ who, who has saved us. He's delivered us from sin. He's redeemed us and reconciled them to to himself. And you can imagine, you know people, you live with people, you recognize people who say, you know what, the Christian life is too hard. It's too difficult. It's too difficult because the giants in the land occupying your heart and your life are too hard to dislodge. Israel's refusal to enter the land becomes a type and a picture of sometimes the believer's refusal to lay hold of the promises of Christ and our inheritance in Christ, which is found in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. So instead of believing God's promises and trusting him, some of the people embrace doubt and disobedience, excuses, why it was impossible to do what God would have them to do. Unbelief sees the obstacles. Faith sees the opportunities. And so, in Numbers 13, it provides us, again, with the names of the men, and then the nature of the mission in, in, in verses 17 through 25, and then we read about the lamentation of the people. It says, the people living there are powerful. Their cities and their towns are fortified and very large. We even saw giants, the descendants of Anak. We felt like grasshoppers next to them. And that's what we looked like to them. So they hear the report, this is impossible. And then they hear the faithful report. The land we explored is wonderful. The Lord is pleased with us. He's going to bring us safely into the land. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people. They don't have protection. We have the Lord. That's the speech of faith. The speech of faith is you have exactly what you need in order to accomplish what God has asked you to do. And Moses recorded the reaction of the people in verses, in chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And the people's plans to return to Egypt. And that's when the Lord said, enough. The Lord becomes angry. And the Lord tells Moses, look, I'm going to disown him. And I'm going to destroy them with a plague. And I'm going to make you a nation far greater and mightier than them. But Moses pleads with the Lord to pardon Israel. Lest the pagans say, the Lord isn't able to bring them out of the land. He swore to them, so he killed them in the wilderness in verses 13 through 19. We then read of the Lord's pardon in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 14. Where it says, then the Lord said, I have pardoned. According to your word, think about what's happening and what Joshua is witnessing in Moses. The Lord said, look, I get it. These people are difficult to work with. I have a great idea. I'll kill all of them and start over with you. And Moses pleads with them. He forgives the people. But there's going to be consequences for their unbelief and rebellion. Again, no one over the age of 20 is going to survive. Only Joshua and Caleb. They're the only ones who are going to be able to enter the land. And again, 
they will wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years until a new generation is born and it becomes a type and a picture of faith and faithfulness. Pastor Chuck Smith was fond of saying that any dead fish can float downstream, but it's going to take courage and faith to swim against the tide of popular opinion. It's going to take courage for us to be able to say, no, the Bible is true. His word is true. His promises are true. We can exercise great faith. And sometimes exercising faith means that you stand alone. We could cite numerous leaders like Martin Luther and like William Wilberforce or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Great Faith will sometimes require you to say something different than the rest of the world is saying. No, the Bible is true. No, Jesus is the Lord. There is salvation and there is grace and there is comfort in Christ. Elton Trueblood said, quote, Faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservation. And that's exactly right. Belief is trust. God had proven himself faithful and trustworthy by delivering the children of Israel from Egypt, by providing the people with protection from the Egyptian army. That becomes our testimony as well. There is a good God who is loving and faithful and kind. He saved me from my sin. He gave me grace instead of guilt. He provided for me. Evelyn Underhill wrote, quote, Faith is not refuge from reality. It is a demand that we face reality with all of its difficulties, with all of its opportunities, with all of its implications. That's what faith does. Faith doesn't ignore the truth. It doesn't deny what's real. It just simply says something way different. And that is that there's hope. That we can trust God. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions. Who believes? Faith answers, I and this is exactly what Joshua is doing. He, remember, has cultivated all of the things that we've already talked about. Remember, prayer. Remember, vision. He sees God in the circumstance that he finds himself in. He becomes devoted to the Lord and then loyal. He has grown it's time for him to exercise faith. And Numbers 14 is perhaps one of the saddest chapters in the entire Bible. Because it's a chapter about a group of people who choose to forget all that God has said, all that God has done, all the power that he has demonstrated, all of the wonders he has demonstrated. All of the deliverance that he has provided. The children of Israel were beneficiaries of God's power and God's glory. And now they were testing him by their sinful attitude of rebellion and unbelief. And sometimes when you get saved and you accept Christ as your savior, there is an invitation on behalf of the people that you grew up with or that you hung out with who try to tempt you to believe that you were better off living in Egypt, living in unbelief, living in slavery. And Caleb and Joshua realized that the people's response was pure rebellion. In chapter 14, verse 9, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Don't turn your back. Don't walk away. And by the way, Moses declines God's offer to start all over with a fresh batch of people. Here's my question to you. Let's just for purposes of discussion entertain a thought. Moses says, okay, burn them. 
Burn them all. Start over with me. Do you think Moses would have produced children less rebellious, less disobedient, less likely to turn their back on God? That's not the solution to the problem, is it? Does God know that? Even God knows that. So why does God even suggest this? I'm going to suggest suggest to you that the answer is because Moses prays in verses 13 through 19 and then he reminds God of his promises and his mercies and his forgiveness. The issue isn't whether or not God wants to exercise pardon and keep his promises and extend mercy. Moses offers his own life and in his grace, God pardons their sin. But in God's government, he is going to allow their sin to produce a bitter fruit. And sometimes rebellion, unbelief, disobedience, means that you make choices that are not honoring, that are not pleasing to the Lord. But God in his grace and his mercy is giving each and every one of us opportunities that if we've fallen, if we've rebelled, if we've stubbornly refused to walk into that place of promise, we can still exercise Faith, Caleb and Joshua are excluded from the judgment because of their faith and because of their faithfulness. Our faith in Christ is what will bring us to that place, not just of comfort, but of hope. Jesus has redeemed us by the sacrifice on Calvary's cross. The sacrifice of Jesus pays for the penalty of our sin, provides us with spiritual riches. We're new creations in Christ, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Remember, all things have passed away. Everything has become new. We've been given what I like to think of as a total spiritual makeover. You've been given a new heart, a new life. We're born of God in John chapter 1 verse 12. We're adopted by God in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. We're children of the promise in Romans chapter 9 verse 8 and Galatians 4.23. We are children of Abraham and we're grafted into Israel. We are the spiritual descendants of the father of faith and we are given the wonderful privilege of exercising a brand new spiritual heritage. That's why when you read the New Testament and you keep hearing Paul referring to you as children of Abraham, that's exactly why. We get to carry this spiritual heritage to the world. We're friends of Jesus, it says in John 15, 15. We're citizens of heaven in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, and Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Prayer, vision, devotion, loyalty brings about faith, confidence, trust. And the next mention that we see of Joshua, look what it says in Numbers chapter 27. If you keep turning just a few more chapters, the next mention of of Joshua takes place in chapter 27, verses 18 and 19. Look what it says in verse 18. And the Lord said to Moses... Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. In this particular passage, Moses is given by the Lord a plan of succession. Joshua is going to be placed in a position of authority. That's what it means to lay your hand on him. 
and then publicly bring Joshua to Eleazar the priest and before all the con congregation, it says, and inaugurate him in their sight. In what sense? Acknowledge who he is in front of the people. Moses is given the opportunity to present Joshua and he is described, not by Moses, look what it says. He's described by God as a man. Read it for yourself. In whom is the spirit. What spirit is that, do you suppose? It's the Holy Spirit. I know you're shocked. Joshua is a Pentecostal. He's a spirit-filled man. What does that mean? What does it mean to be filled with the spirit or a man in whom is the spirit? I'm going to suggest to you at least a couple of things. It has to mean that he has demonstrated the character of the spirit. Remember in Galatians when it talks about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. It isn't just, again, I think, a reflection of the character of the spirit, but also of the power of the spirit. But also, I'm going to suggest to you that it means he's guided by the spirit and he's led by the spirit. Joshua is both filled by the Spirit of God and led by the Spirit of God. And all of this becomes so very, very important if you're going to be a Spirit-filled leader, if you're going to be a spiritual leader. We need Spirit-filled servant leaders. Spiritual leadership isn't simply a matter of personal power, but spiritual power by the Holy Spirit. And the New Testament confirms this. In Acts chapter 6, verses 3, and then again in verse 5, you'll remember the dispute that takes place between the Greek-speaking widows and the Hebrew-speaking widows. And the apostles say in Acts chapter 3, verse 5, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we can appoint over this business. How in the world did the people know that these people are going to be filled with the Spirit? It says in verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenian, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. But again, I'm going to suggest to you that the reason why the people looked at these particular people and could say with confidence that they're full of the spirit and wisdom is because these were men of prayer and vision and devotion and loyalty and faith and then they began to reflect the character of the spirit in their life with the interaction of the people who were there do you want to serve in the church do you want to serve in your family do you want to serve in the world being filled with the Spirit isn't just a, a theological construct. It is the very necessity that makes service possible. So what does this mean? What does this mean to be filled with the Spirit? We know that when a person receives Christ, that, that person is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Paul commands believers to live under the ongoing influence and presence of the Holy Spirit by allowing the Word of God to control their thoughts and control their actions. You'll remember when Paul actually says, you should keep on keeping on being filled with the Spirit. He is not just suggesting, but he's requiring that you are controlled by the Spirit in the way that you think, in the way that you speak, in the way that you respond to one another. We're to pursue lives of purity. We're to confess sin. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says this. I should have wrote it down, but it just came to my mind. It says, 
let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit are exactly the same thing in Galatians 15, 5, 16 through 23, 19 through 21. And, and, and again, we see the, the Spirit being filled with the Spirit, the immediate consequences of obeying the command to be filled with the Spirit results in something amazing. In Galatians, I, I just feel like I need to read it. In Galatians chapter 5, in verse 18, it says, for if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In verse 19, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. And then it gives the laundry list of all of the things that are bad. And then in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and longsuffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, self-control against such. There is no such law. And in 19 through 21, being filled with the Spirit results in exactly the opposite of walking in the flesh. There's singing, there's giving of thanks, there's humility, there's submitting to one another. In other words, whatever it means to be filled with the Spirit, it means that the content of your heart changes and then your speech changes. Erwin Lutzer, the former pastor of Moody Church, said, quote, to be controlled by the Spirit means that we are not controlled by what happens on the outside, but we start to become controlled by what's happening on the inside. And that's a perfect description. Because think about all of the times that you're manipulated by the things that happen on the outside. When people say things, or do things. Erwin Lutzer also says the spirit's control will replace sin's control. That is powerful. The spirit's control will replace sin's control. His power is greater than the power of all of your sin. Now I want you to think about Lutzer's statement in light of what the scripture says. Because what the scripture is suggesting that rather be, than being manipulated by unbelief and sin, you become empowered by the Spirit. By the way, is this something that Joshua is absolutely going to have to have in order to be an effective leader so that the people can occupy the promises of God? I think that the answer is yes. The Lord Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, the filling of the Spirit is going to result in the ability to say the things that are true about the gospel. When it says the spirit comes upon you, you'll be filled with power and you'll be witnesses. What, what does that mean? Jehovah's witnesses? No, that's not what it means. Not like the people who go not. The witness, remember, there are three things that you need in order to be a witness. You have to have a knowledge of the facts. You have to have a reputation for honesty. And then you have to have a willingness to tell the truth. The facts about what? The facts about Jesus. You have to have a knowledge of the facts. Human beings are sinners. They need a savior. Jesus is that savior. He loves you. He died on the cross for your sin. He rose from the dead for your justification. You're a witness in what way? You have a knowledge of the facts. You have a reputation for honesty. And you have a willingness to tell the truth. The truth about what? What he's done for you, how he loves you, how he's changed you. V. Raymond Edmonds said, quote, the spirit-filled life is no mystery. 
revealed to a select few. No goal difficult of attainment. To trust and obey is the substance of the matter. In other words, it's not warm, fuzzy feelings in the pit of your stomach. It isn't having your hair stand on end. It, it isn't chill bumps up and down your spine. Being filled with the Spirit is acknowledging that the Holy Spirit gets to determine what's in your heart and what's on your mouth. Remember, we're called the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the living Spirit of God inside of us, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. It isn't a reward because you've been faithful or because you go to church or because you read your Bible or because you've let go of certain things in your life. You receive the Spirit the same way you receive Christ by grace, through faith. And finally, the last mention of Joshua. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. Look what it says. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hand on him, so that the children of Israel heeded him, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Remember the context. In verse 5, Moses is dead. It says in verse 5, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. And that Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes weren't dim. He must have had spiritual LASIK. His natural vigor diminished. And it says, and the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. And again, now the mention of Joshua. Joshua is Moses' servant before he's Moses' successor. He is full of the spirit of wisdom, evidenced by God. And the people. Moses dies on Mount Nebo. And again we learn that he's buried in a valley. Somewhere in what's now modern Jordan. No one knows where even to this day. Why do you suppose that is? Have you ever wondered why they never found Moses' grave? Some people have suggested. Because the children of Israel didn't need one more idol to worship. And that might be. I have a different answer. I'm going to suggest to you that God might have some unfinished business with that body of Moses. Some people have suggested that in the last days, Elijah and Moses might make a return and be the two final witnesses at the end of days. We don't know that for sure. We know we see Moses in the New Testament in a glorified body speaking to Jesus about the journey to the cross. But you can imagine the void left by Moses' death. He's dead. And there's an emptiness and a darkness and a mourning and the people are standing on the outskirts. They're coming up to the river Jordan. And Joshua, Joshua, Joshua is going to need to hear from God. Joshua is confirmed as, as Moses' successor in accordance with the word of God. Joshua is going to assume the military, the administrative duties. And you're, you're going to note that Joshua possesses, look what it says, the spirit of wisdom that means spiritual wisdom. In other words, he's going to need military ability, but he's going to also need administrative ability, 
and he's going to need spiritual ability. But Joshua is prepared and Joshua is qualified and Joshua is wise. And I'm going to suggest to you that Joshua's available. In other words, all of these things, prayer, vision, devotion, loyalty, faith, being filled with the Spirit, but now he is the right person at the right time with the right abilities, with wisdom and integrity. Let me just ask you an awful question. It's horrible that I even have to ask the question. How important is wisdom and integrity in leadership? You wouldn't think so by looking at the current political climate, would you? Wisdom, integrity. But I'm going to suggest to you that we've never needed it more than right now. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's okay for you not to. To settle for anything less than wisdom and integrity. You'll recall in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 13, Moses was told, choose wise, understanding, knowledgeable men from among the tribes. I'll make them heads over you. Oswald Chambers wrote, quote, self-chosen authority is an impertinence. Jesus said that the great ones in this world exercise authority, but in his kingdom, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. No one exercises authority over another because in his kingdom, the king is the servant of all. If a saint tries to exercise authority, it's proof that he isn't rightly related to Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus says, I am going to model integrity, wisdom, service, humility. Lord Acton rightly said, quote, no authority has the power to impose error. And if it resists the truth, the truth must be upheld until it is admitted. So what does it mean? What does it mean for the servant leader to be available? We all have schedules. We all have priorities. We all have obligations. The Lord Jesus made God's plan, God's will, the highest priority in his life. And Joshua, Joshua's priority will become serving the Lord God of Israel and the people that God called him to serve. It will become his singular, driving force. What does it mean to be available? I saw the illustration when your car sits silent in the garage, it's still available if you need it. There it is, sitting in the garage, just waiting to be used. Unless it's broken. Unless it doesn't run. Unless something has gone terribly wrong. Availability isn't simply an attitude in your mind. It's an ability in your life and in your heart. In order to be available, you have to have your priorities straight. So I'm going to ask you a different question. What's on the top of your to-do list? What's on the top of your list of who you are in Christ, the priority that God is giving to you, and then how to accomplish it? Let me put the question a little bit differently. Are you available to the Lord? And again, I'm going to suggest to you that availability that's preceded by prayer and vision and loyalty and faith and being filled with the Holy Spirit, 
Now when you are available, if you make yourself available, you say, Lord, I want to make myself available to you then it could very well be that God will put a man, a woman, a person, someone in your life and say, I want you to care for this person and I want you to love this person and I want you to speak this to this person. I want you to be available to me so that I can make you available to them. Will you put others ahead of yourself? Will you find a way to help or will you find a way to hide? Will you be ready when the time comes? When the calling comes? When the service is required? Remember, God was at work preparing Joshua. And part of that preparation included understanding the power of prayer, cultivating a vision of God, devotion to the things of the Lord, a God-honoring loyalty, an ever-increasing faith, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then available at, ex at the exact moment that it was going to be necessary. Joshua was going to prepare the children of Israel to conquer and occupy a land. And the preparation that he is going to have to provide for the people is both spiritual in chapters 5 all the way to chapter 12 of Joshua and military chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. Joshua is going to employ a divine strategy. The strategy is to divide and conquer the enemies that are occupying the land. And I'm going to suggest to you that this divine strategy didn't just all of a sudden appear one night in Joshua's mind. And there's a huge spiritual application for each and every one of us. We have to begin to identify the things that are hurting us as a church and then hurting us as individuals God's calling Joshua and the children of Israel to occupy a land to occupy a land by a people who don't want to leave and God in Christ is calling us to occupy the person of Jesus. But sometimes there are things in our mind and things in our heart and things in our circumstances that don't want to leave. And so we're going to have to recognize just who our enemies are. We're going to have to recognize the tools that God has given us to divide and then conquer the world, the flesh, the devil. Jesus has reconciled us to himself. Jesus has ransomed us on the cross of Calvary. We were held hostage to sin and death and the devil. And we are redeemed. We've been bought back with the precious blood of Jesus who's canceled our debt. Many of you left Egypt a long time ago. But some of you, some of you have toyed with the idea of going back. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you're ready to leave Egypt, if you're tired of wandering in the wilderness, if you want to occupy the place of promise, if you want to enjoy victorious, abundant, repeated victories, And show up for the Joshua study. Let's pray. Lord. 
Lord, as we've looked at the life of Joshua and we've seen the experiences of prayer and vision, devotion and loyalty and faith and being filled with the Spirit and available. But Lord, we know that these are the things that we're going to need to cultivate as we prepare to enter into a place that some of us have never been to. We've lived lives of brokenness and recovery, but we've only had limited experiences with victory. Lord, I pray that you would place in our hearts a deep desire to know your presence, to know your promises, and to experience your power so that we can live lives that are honoring and pleasing to you. So Lord, I pray that you would stir up hope within each and every man and woman's heart about the journey that we're about to take. In Jesus' name.